Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to JAX Live. My name is Natalie Herlin with the JAX, Jackson Laboratory. And joining me from Sacramento, California is Dr. Jane Zhao, product development scientist. And from his home office in Maine, we have Dr. Brian Soper, manager of technical information services. Hey, everybody. And as a reminder, JAX is here. We're open for business. We're performing studies. We were, we're here to answer your questions and deliver mics. So, Jing and Brian, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourselves to our audience? Okay. Go ahead, Jing. Oh. Hi. Hi, Natalie. Thank you to invite me. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I joined JAX almost three years ago before JAX. Um, I had worked at UCLA uh, investigating the functional role of the tumor suppressor P10 on um, cancer development and stem cell function. Um, once I joined JAX, I have been very excited to work on humanized mice and uh, its application on immune oncology drug development. So currently, I am a senior scientist at JAX product development. Um, I'm focused on developing novel preclinical model for cancer immune therapy. Um, one of my project um, is to develop a characterized mice model for evaluation uh, CAR T efficacy. So CAR T therapy is uh, such an exciting field. I'm very glad um, I have this opportunity to share with you today. Um, thank you. Thanks, right. Jane. Yeah. Um, Again, I'm Brian Soper. I've been at the Jackson Laboratory for 25 years now. I first came to JAX back in 1995 to do my postdoctoral research, and I became a grant-funded scientist in uh, the field of hematopoietic stem cell biology. And at the time, we were not only understanding the biology of the hematopoietic stem cells, but using them to in transplantation so that we could treat a mouse model of a human disease that had an enzyme deficiency. Uh, and these normal donor hematopoietic cells uh, could replace the enzyme that was missing. Uh, so from there, uh, of course, I had to understand the, all the different aspects of the hematopoietic stem cell, bone marrow transplantation, and then of course the immunobiology that surrounds all of that. Because of course, if we were going to apply any of this to uh, the human population, we had to understand allogenicity, uh, looking at immune tolerance and things like that. So uh, I had uh, really kind of bolstered my expertise in understanding immunity and the immunity that develops following bone marrow transplantation. Uh, these days I work for a group called Technical Information Sciences, and it's the goal of me and my team to understand all of the biology around the different mouse models that JAX offers. And based on my scientific background, I have a lot of expertise in understanding the, the highly immunodeficient mice and the transplantation of human hematopoietic stem cells uh, and putting in human peripheral blood mononuclear cells and using those mice to understand the therapies and preclinical applications around them. So. Great. Thank you so much, guys. So today's topic, we're here to talk about CAR-T therapy. And CAR-T is a form of immunotherapy. It's shown great promise in treating blood cancers. But before you can use these therapies in the clinic, they need to be tested in a preclinical model to evaluate their efficacy. And that's what Brian and Jing are gonna to talk to us about here today. So as a reminder, before we get started, audience, please use the comment box below on the video on LinkedIn and Twitter to submit your questions, to send a comment, or send us a shout out. And I see we've already got shout outs from Italy, Iran, Iowa City, the UK and San Diego. Thanks for joining us here today. Uh, excellent. Thank you. So I'd like to get started with you, Jing. Can you tell us a little bit, what is CAR-T therapy and how is it used to treat cancer? Uh, sure. Uh, CAR-T therapy stands for chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy. Um, as we know, cancer cells are pretty smart to um, deceive our immune system to get not to get rid of them. So CAR T therapy can reprogram a patient's T cells so that they can recognize and attack tumors. The CAR is a synthetic receptor on the T cell surface that recognizes the antigen on the cancer cell. So how it happened? So first, T cells can be isolated from patient blood. Um, an inactive virus is used to insert the CAR genes into these T cells. Then the engineer cells are uh, modified in the lab before we put back in the um, patient's bloodstream. 
The interaction between CAR T cells and tumor cells lead to CAR T uh, expansion in vivo, and then become toxic. They can destroy the cancer cells. So it's really amazing um, that one single dose CAR T therapy actually can show breakthrough success in some lymphoma and leukemia patients. Um, in addition, since it's a living drug, the benefits actually can last for um, years. So reducing the risk of relapse. Um, um, hey, Brian, you want to add anything? Yeah, I think there's a lot of excitement around CAR T therapies. There's two clinically available uh, approaches to this that are being used today. It's showing a lot of great promise. Uh, these two approaches have been primarily focused on B cell lymphomas, and we'll talk more about that today. But uh, people have recognized uh, what a great response they can achieve from this approach. And so there's a huge amount of research now looking at how to move this broadly, uh, other hematological cancers besides B-cell lymphomas, of course, but also into solid tumors. And so we need a testing platform to take a look at these different approaches. Uh, and so there's a lot of excitement around this for sure. All right. So if I got this right, we're talking about taking a patient's own cells, engineering them, and then putting them back in the patient to help treat their cancer. And Brian, you mentioned something there in your last comment. You said it's important to be able to test these therapies. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the way that researchers check to see if these therapies work before they start administering them to patients? Yeah, of course, There, you know, first you've got to find a really unique antigen on the tumor compartment, and you try to find something that's highly expressed and not expressed on other cells and tissues of the body because you want these cells to react specifically towards your target and towards those cancer cells. And so once people identify those and they develop this synthetic construct and use these uh, viruses to introduce them into the patient's T cells, they'll often use an in vitro assay, basically perform experience in a culture dish to take these cells and show that they respond against the tumors. But then the next phase of that um, is really to move that into what we would call an in vivo setting a preclinical testing setting. Now, the early molecules uh, went often right from in vitro and into the human patient. Obviously, they did a number of safety studies and things like that. But as we begin to expand and try different techniques, we really need a preclinical mouse model to ensure safety and efficacy and things like that. And so the mouse, uh, the immunodeficient mouse, particularly the NSG in this case, this is a NOD background, skid mutation, IL-2 receptor gamma chain mutation, so combining these three components in a model where you can have an immunodeficient mouse, you put a human tumor in and humor, uh, a human specific T cells that have modulated, put them in together into a living system to see how they all work together is, it would re is a really big help to the scientific community. And Jing, you've done these studies here at the Jackson lab, right? Do you have any examples you can share with us? Yes, uh, we use several CAR T um, the cells. Um, Actually, I can give example um, how we test um, the new batch of CD19 CAR T cells. Uh, for example, once we get back the CD19 CAR T cells, we want to know whether uh, it still have the in vivo function and how this batch compared to last batch. Um, so to do this experiment, uh, we pick a Raji cell line. This is a B lymphoma cell line with high CD19 expression, like Brian just interpret um, CD19 expressed in the tumor cells and then the CAR T, we call CD19 CAR T cells, which they can recognize the, uh, the cell surface marker CD19 expressed on the Raji cells. So we're also using the Lucifer tag to label these Raji cells so that we can track down the disease progression and therapeutic response through the in vivo optical imaging. So by um, imaging analyze, uh, we can compare the CAR T treated group, the PBS treated group, and then um, also the mock CAR T treated group, uh, what their tumor burden difference. Um, so our results show actually um, the CD19 CAR T treated group shows significant decreased tumor burden um, so we know this CAR T, uh, CD19 CAR T, this batch is functional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, when Jing, when you're doing this experiment in the lab, how do you generate those CD19 CAR T cells? Um, 
we using um, the healthy patient PBMC, okay. and then um, there's outsourced company they can uh, customize to make the CAR T for us. Okay, okay. So now if I have this straight, we have the CAR T cells from one patient and a tumor cell line or a tumor from another patient, and then we're putting all these things together in a mouse model. How does that work? How well can we model immune system interactions using a setup like this? Yeah, that's a great question because there's a lot to think about there. Uh, we need to remember that these are mouse models, so they do have their limitations, and every single mouse model of human disease will. And then we have to take into account all these different immunological differences between these compartments. So we're starting with an animal that's highly immunodeficient. It is acceptable for accepting these human tumors in them because the mouse has uh, lost uh, functional T cells, B cells, and K cells, things like that. And then we've got a patient-derived T cell population. And one thing that we need to remember is this patient-derived T cells are going to have receptors on the surface, T cell receptors, which are used to engage pathogens and recognize their targets, et cetera. We're introducing another construct that's gonna put up our synthetic receptor. However, those original receptors are from a human. And so when they see mouse MHC class one and class two molecules, they have the ability to respond against those tissues and cause what would be a graft versus host disease response. Mm -hmm. And going back to what Jin said a few moments ago, this is very important. She mentioned the inclusion of a study arm that would be the mock transduced group of cells. And that's critically important because that group of cells is going to have some immunological responses against the tissue. So you need to be able to delineate what's going on with those cells and those receptors versus the introduced receptor and everything that's going to be happening due to that. So most of these studies are usually kind of a short window of operation so that we don't have GVH overcoming the situation, but it can answer those critical questions about seeing these T cells respond to the tumor. So those things need to be taken into consideration. So I'm, I'm wondering, what are some of the ways, Brian, you mentioned early on that the two FDA approved CAR T therapies are used for blood cancers. What are some of the ways we might broaden the applicability of CAR T therapies, moving into things like solid tumors? Yeah, so we've got uh, a lot of different things that people are beginning to think about. If you look at the uh, human efficacy study, or excuse me, the human clinical studies, while these are working really well, they don't work to 100% efficiency. So there's a lot more that we need to know and understand. Yeah. So one of the things we've done is we've developed a mouse model called a double knockout mouse. And what that means is that we've taken the NSG mouse and we've knocked out the mouse MHC class one and the MHC class two. Now the advantage of this is so that when these cells go in, they don't have this graft versus host disease response. In other words, you could take human peripheral blood mononuclear cells and just inject them into these mice, they will engraft, and these mice have long-term survival because they don't have the molecules to interact with. So, so that allows us to do these more longer-term studies. We can see efficacy, and then we can re-challenge those mice with tumors to see if those T cells, that we, the CAR T cells can respond against those tumors. But there's some other really interesting things that people are doing. Now we've talked about the CAR T cells. There's a population of cells out there now that people are calling the truck T cells. Mm -hmm. What are those? Those are T cells that have been double manipulated. In other words, they're expressing these new receptors that they've been introduced. But another construct goes in to express different cytokines like interleukin 12, interleukin 18, interleukin 15, because sometimes these CAR Ts will enter a particular tumor and then the tumor still has the ability to shut these cells down. And so if they're expressing these molecules, they can keep those T cell populations going. So people are looking at that and the other looking at manipulations like uh, shutting down some different pathways that would shut down the T cells. PD-1, PD-L1 pathway comes to mind. I don't know if, Jing, you've got yes. some other ideas. The, uh, you mentioned the several, um, the, the new uh, CAR-T construct, they all, uh, people try in solid tumor per clinical model, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And so always, always with the challenge there is you want to ensure that you don't have some kind of off-target effects. If we, if we go back and we think about the B-cell lymphomas, normal human B-cells are going to be depleted. Uh, what's beautiful about our hematopoietic system, though, is we've got the stem cell population in the bone marrow. So in human patients, they can just remake uh, these B-cell compartments uh, and so that the patients can respond. So, but we need, to, when, we, when we start thinking about going to these solid tumors, we have to be conscious of these off-target effects or T-cells respond to other organs and tissues and things like that and thinking about safety. So having these mouse models that we can genetically manipulate and use for these different things, different things are, are very important and very powerful. Yeah. We have a question from the audience, and I'd love to get your opinion on this, Jing and Brian. One of our mm -hmm. viewers asked, can CAR-T therapy be used for just cancer, or are there other disease areas, such as inflammatory diseases, where CAR-T therapy might apply? Um, I think CAR-T therapy can apply uh, a lot of things, not only just cancer, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, I've seen them. Uh, I've seen some recent papers where people are applying these to uh, uh, autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, looking at very specific cell populations that maybe they'd like to uh, get out of the control loop, uh, regulatory T cells that are causing aberrant problems with uh, certain immune cell populations that are expanding out, maybe making antibodies that they shouldn't be to certain human tissues, and looking at ways to attack certain immune cell populations that are defective or causing some of this dysregulation to try to put things back in balance. So uh, it, it's a really interesting time and people are beginning to think about these tools in very interesting ways. Thank you. Well, I'd like to switch things up a little bit, Jane and Brian. How about we do a lightning round? Now, in this session, I'm going to give you a word, and I'd love to hear the first thing that comes to mind as your association with that word, all right? Okay. Uh, let's start with cell therapy. Jing, what's the association you have with cell therapy? Uh, first one, CAR-T cell therapy, right. yeah, and then promising, uh, breakthrough, um, powerful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm thinking about the, the efficacy and the ways that we can really uh, apply these technologies where, like was said earlier, we talked about, you know, hopefully we can uh, give these patients one treatment and it's a long lasting treatment that's going to maintain uh, their tumor suppression over a long period of time. So it's exciting. Okay. How about Carl June? And for our viewers, if you could explain to them who he is. Um, I can pick that one. Yeah, Carl right. Jung, the, um, we can say CAR-T pioneer mm -hmm. and uh, um, the scientist. Um, but interestingly, uh, recently I read the news, um, he, he got the COVID-19 and um, very luckily he recovered. So now he actually want to using his research experience to fight the um, COVID-19. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's amazing how uh, different things can happen that are unfortunate, but maybe can lead to interesting new different scientific discoveries. And for those of you who don't know Carl June, if you really want to learn something about CAR-T, uh, throw his name into PubMed and you'll find a wealth mm -hmm. of uh, papers out there. Uh, he's doing a lot of interesting work. I have another question from the audience for you both. So our viewer asks, are there studies that have examined how CAR T cell therapy affects the tumor microenvironment? Yes. Yeah, I mean, certainly from the context of people understanding what happens when these CAR T cells enter the tumor and you can harvest those tumors after they enter and start asking some of those scientific questions. Um, particularly in the context of if they did start working, why did they stop working? Um, and getting into these fourth and fifth generation truck uh, t cells, because people are looking at ways of uh, inhibiting RNAs to manipulate pathways that have led to them shut down. And a lot of these things are causing these T cells to shut down due to the microenvironment because it's a it's an environment where they can upregulate things uh, to shut down the T cells and regulate them, uh, shut, uh, reversing the expression of uh, 
uh, tumor antigens can sometimes be downregulated, and you get immunological escape, looking at ways to re-upregulate those things. So yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways people are looking at that. And the mouse uh, provides us an opportunity to look at human specific expression patterns, uh, molecules on the surface and pathways, and truly really start ad answering those questions in a very human specific way. What's a, um... So I have another question, and this has to do with the clinical setting, but you might be able to answer this at least with what you know about preclinical studies in mice. So I'm gonna throw it out there. Um, our viewer asked, for patients undergoing CAR T therapy, is their T cell production suppressed? Mm. T cell? Like, mm -hmm. Not to my knowledge. Okay. All right. So um, actually the preclinical model, they definitely show the um, Katruda uh, combined with the CAR T um, actually, uh, can syngenic effect, yeah. So uh, they actually now have a new CAR T construct, which uh, they, they can uh, delete the suppression effect. So that's why the, the improve the CAR T function in the long term. Yeah, and, and I think some people are trying to look for some bystander effects as well. So you've got your engineered CAR T and you add something like pembolizumab in there to get them over this energic stage that maybe some of those other T cells that are uh, already in the tumor that have infiltrated the tumor, uh, you get a second bystander effect from that where you actually get other T cells to begin release from energy and responding. So they're taking advantage of those T cells mm -hmm. that are already there. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time for today. So I want to thank you, Jing and Brian, for our productive discussion. We've covered a lot of ground here on preclinical models for CAR T therapy. And if we didn't get to your questions, audience, we'll be sure to follow up with you. Join us next Wednesday, same bat time, same bat channel, for our next Jack li Jack's Live. And we're going to be discussing antibody studies in FCRN mice. So have a great, a good morning, a good afternoon, or and a good night, depending on where you are. Thanks again for All joining. Right. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thank you.